Welcome to Sales Players, the number one podcast for top players in B2B sales. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out in the world of sales, this is the show for you. We're all about bringing you fresh, actionable ideas to supercharge your rev gen game. We dive deep into the mindset, habits, and tools used by top performers in the industry. Generate more leads, close more deals, and build wealth and financial security in B2B sales. So if you're ready to level up, you've come to the right place. Join the conversation with other like-minded sales players and continue the discussion beyond the show. Hit the subscribe button, tune into the sales players, and let's start winning together. Hey there, sales players. Today's episode is brought to you by our amazing new sponsor, Lemlist. Whether you're closing deals or nurturing leads, Lemlist is your all-in-one platform for personalization outreach that converts. Picture this. You craft a killer email campaign in minutes using Lemlist Intuitive Drag and Drop Editor. Want to stand out? Lemlist is here to help with advanced personalization that lets you dynamically insert custom images, videos, and even personalized landing pages based on your persona. With Limless Analytics, you'll know exactly who opened, clicked, and replied to your emails. Join thousands of sales professionals who trust Limless to supercharge their outreach efforts. Use the link in the show notes below and start your free trial today. Your personalized outreach just got a whole lot easier. Happy selling. What's going on sales players, it's Jesse here and I wanna introduce you to a genuinely cool product that we just learned about called Evie AI. It is a LinkedIn AI content assistant that was built to enhance your LinkedIn presence, increase your exposure and productivity as a seller. You can create personas, generate ideas, generate comments, craft posts, and 10X your LinkedIn presence. We actually had Joe, the founder on the show, And he was kind enough to put together a special offer for sales players. There is a link in the show notes with more details. Go check out Evie AI. That's E-V-Y AI. All right. We are officially live here. We have got Devin Hennig. Is that how you pronounce it, Devin? That's right. Awesome. I should have asked that before we hit record. Welcome to sales players. And uh, I think a good starting point for our listeners if you're not familiar with Devin and his work, or if you haven't checked out his TikTok channel, uh, maybe Devin, give us a little bit of overview about where you come from and what you're working on right now. Sure thing. Hey, players, sales players. Is that what you call your your crew? Yeah. We yep. should. Yeah, yeah players. The players. Yep, the sales <laughs> players. That's who we are. Well, hey, players. I'm, uh, I'm a small town kid from Saskatchewan, Canada. It's basically the, uh, the middle of nowhere, super flat, super cold. And I always had dreams of leaving and being successful. So, I mean, after I graduated, I thought, hey, I'll, I'll be an entrepreneur. That's how I'll make my fortune and started a media company. And then that was a total dumpster fire. And then after that, I was a game show host for a while. while and that was another old crazy kind of saga. But um, when that all settled down, I finally got into tech and I landed myself at a tech company. And I thought, wow this is it. Uh, it was a hot startup. It was, uh, you know, everything was a rocket ship, I think at that point. And one of the founders, you know, telling people we are going to pay off everyone's mortgage. You'll all be taken care of that whole story that we're always sold. So I just sort of like yep. signed on the dotted line, no questions about stock options or severance or negotiating or any of that. And, uh, it's, you know, it's all going to work out. That was sort of the start of my, my journey there. And, and part of it did work out. I think, you know, I was early at a startup. I was able to leapfrog positions all the way up to a VP pretty early. Um, but even at that point, I'd accumulated very little equity and left literally millions of dollars on the table. So when I eventually quit, I, uh, I, I got my eyes open a little bit in my next role. And when I was working with mentors, found out about all the other things I should be negotiating. So uh, fast forward, that's kind of what I'm up to today. I, uh, I'm helping execs negotiate more because a lot don't know how to do that. And uh, it led to posting a bunch of on, on social media and that grew into the whole TikTok thing you mentioned. And then I wrote this book, The Senior Compensation Bible, which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about today. And uh yeah, I'm, I'm just here to help people improve their compensation because it's, it's something no one really teaches you how to do. And it was a big gap that I, I found in my own career.
And something that before we get into this, you're going to want to save this episode because this is something you want to listen to before you sign that dotted line. You don't want to have already signed your compensation without consulting somebody like Devin or, you know, pushing back on your options. And I think that this is going to be a really good conversation for people that are looking to move up in their role. Like I am looking to scale up in my current role and I want to ask Devin, like, what should I be on the lookout for as an individual contributor looking to potentially go into a VP role? Like, what should I be thinking about? Mm -hmm. Also, um, you know, how to not sound like a douche and uh, with the compensation. Like that was one of the TikTok videos that I watched. And I think that that's something that I sort of have imposter syndrome is pushing back on, mm. do I really have a state at the a, a place at the table um, when compensation is put in front of me and how to deal with that? So I'd really like to go into that and talk about that. Yeah, you just mentioned, uh, I think before we start recording, most of your listeners are at that individual contributor letter level and just ready to almost get into that next step at the director or VP or whatever it is that comes next. And that's when the rubber really hits the road. I mean, up until that point, you've probably had some pretty rigid stand it, standard comp plans. Uh, you're used to maybe negotiating a little bit of salary and bonus and vacation or something like that. But when you get to the next level, there's just so much more that you can be thinking about and a lot more leverage you have to, to unlock other parts of your offers. So um, yeah, I'd love to dive deeper into that. Yeah. I think, you know, especially at that level, a lot of the, the things to focus on, I call them are like the what, the why, and the how. So, you know, what should you be negotiating? How can you negotiate it? And, you know, why is it important to negotiate it and get into the right mindset? So, I mean, we can break down all that stuff. Happy to, to dive in. Yeah. Tell us about the what, the why. So what was it? What, why, how? Yeah. Yeah. This is my little, uh, my Easy little way to, to organize it, I guess. Yeah. So with the, the what, I really think most leaders I talk to, especially the new ones, the ones who are just coming up from that, call it the AE or equivalent level in different functions, like they're just not confident or good at negotiating because they don't know what to ask for. It's not that they're like bad at negotiating in general. It's just that they don't know what's possible yet. So like, mm -hmm. like I said before, they might be used to salary bonus vacation. They don't know about severance. They don't know about milestone payments. They don't know about all the advanced equity terms they could be getting that they should ask for or like dive into. So there's that huge knowledge gap on on what those things are. And there are 30, 40, 50 of them that, that people just don't know. So they don't get. Uh, and then at the how level, it's more about the negotiation piece itself. So a lot of folks that I talk to just aren't practice negotiators. Um, most of them aren't in sales, unlike maybe your audience. So they aren't even used to negotiating. And it's an art, as I'm sure everyone listening knows. It takes practice. So yeah, that how piece is huge, like how to use ranges and odd numbers and make sure you don't go first and like all those like kind of basic concepts and principles. Um, and then finally, yeah, like the why is probably the biggest setback for people, especially outside of sales, because it's that mindset piece. It's like, why should I negotiate? Why don't I just take the first offer? Mm. And usually people take the first offer because they don't want to seem greedy or they're worried they're going to lose the opportunity or something when that's not often true. It's just incredibly rare that an offer breaks down at the offer stage. Uh, so yeah. you need to work on that mindset and having the big money energy and being confident enough to ask for more. And that's where a lot of folks have, have some issues they need to work out. So what are, what are some ways that you can retrain your mindset? And I know for me, just speaking to my own experience, I know as I've gotten more professional experience and, and more wins under my belt and more you know skills that I've developed, it's gotten a little bit easier because I can have that confidence coming into a conversation where I say, I know what my worth is because I know exactly what I'm going to deliver to this business. You know, not exactly, but I have a pretty good idea of what I'm capable of delivering to the business. And that's based on my track record of what I've done for other companies that I've worked at uh, or other companies I've helped, right? Mm -hmm. But I know when I was early in my career, 
I was, I was always a little nervous to make an ask, especially at the offer stage. Cause for some reason there's this mindset that like, what if they pull the offer? Because I'm just, I come across as a douche or too greedy or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I don't, I don't want that to happen. Are there things you coach your, your clients on to maybe help get, you know, reframe that mindset uh, away from this fear that you're going to come across as greedy if you're asking for your worth? A hundred percent. Like most people, again, think that they don't want to seem greedy or they're worried they're going to lose the opportunity. But when a company sends you an offer, you have the leverage, right? Like you don't, they're not sending offers to multiple people. They're really hoping this is going to work out because there's a material expense to restarting the the search process, right? So it's yeah. it's just you and the ball's in your court. The leverage is with you. And I think in terms of like actionable things people could do or what I often find helps people is realizing they have that leverage, um, potentially drumming up extra leverage to make them feel better. So if they can get multiple offers, that's mm-hmm. always a good thing because yeah, you have multiple yeah. to play off of, right? You can be going back and forth, even if you have a preferred one and, you know, feel a little bit safer that you're going to be able to pay the bills kind of thing. Certainly recommend surrounding yourself with people who can help, um, be it a mentor, folks that you listen to on this podcast and others. And then personally, I mean, I'm a huge reader. I mentioned that that big money energy thing. That's that Ryan Serhant book. I'm just working my way through if people are or Serhant fans, I, I recommend it. But, okay. you know, yeah. overall, looking just to be confident and patient, but persistent and and practicing. Yeah. A couple of tips I'll share just from my own personal experience uh, on that front for listeners too. So I had a mentor who was a like incredible negotiator. She was just, you know, she she made some crazy moves in her career where she went from, you know, X to X plus 40%, right? In mm-hmm. terms of compensation or whatever, like I was just giving an example that she had done some moves where, you know, she doubled her salary or something like that at different points. And one of the things she taught me in our just time together was try to train your, tra- train yourself to ask for a number that's, that makes you physically uncomfortable to ask for. <laughs> and I, that might sound really extreme to a lot of people, but I did it when I was negotiating an offer. And while I didn't get that super uncomfortable number, I only got a little bit underneath that. It was way more than I thought I was going to get. And I'm glad I I'm glad I pushed myself. And then the other tip she gave was to actually, when you're about to get on the call with a recruiter and get an offer letter, is to take a sticky note or a notepad and write down what your rock bottom and then maybe a middle number that would be like, all right, this would be ideal. And then that crazy stomach wrenching number where it's like, ooh, that would be... I would maybe feel like a uh, like a douche asking for that, but like let's try, let's start there. Mm. But then obviously putting a number down that's like I can't go underneath that number. I will walk away mm. from this. And then so at the, bo- like at the bottom of that sticky note, just write "Become the king of the awkward silence." Like learn just Ooh. how to say those things and then shut up. Yeah. Uh, there was a great. I don't know if your listeners also listen to my first million or whatever, mm-hmm. but um, oh, yeah. oh yeah, they talked about. I think Sean talked about being you know, having a condo on Awkward Island. He's so good at it. And uh, he he said how, like, back in the day, people, maybe a boss or a mentor or something, would, like, literally hit mute on the phone so that they couldn't talk anymore, uh, even if they really, really wanted to or started to or whatever. It's just, like, shut up. It's gonna I do that. If I'm on a cell phone, I will mute my iPhone when I'm on a negotiation-type call. Mm-hmm. Um, or if it's a Zoom or something, then it's the same thing. Just mute down. Devin, I want to flip the script and talk about what are the levers that a company has to give a person an offer? Like, how do they structure this? And like, how can we go into the game of like, how is the game played Mm. instead of just being players in the game? What are the Um, levers? Can they just do anything? Or is there like, (laughs) uh, is there different factors that at different levels of companies that we need to be focused on? Yeah, everything is negotiable. Like this is that old Jay-Z, you don't ask, you don't get kind of thing, right? Like so many things that that folks aren't even creative enough around that we can talk about. But um, if you think about the biggies, I mean, you're going to have your base, your variable, your equity, your severance, like 
th those are sort of the main things you're working about working with and then a lot of details within each of them so yeah if you yeah go through those one by one i mean maybe i can cover some mistakes i've seen and that'll help people avoid those traps but um severance severance i like talking about off the bat because most people don't have it and when you get to that more senior level it should just be a given like Pavilion mm -hmm. put out a report uh, recently that said something like 70 or 71 percent of execs just don't have severance in 2024. And it's criminal. Uh, yeah. It's it's one of the first mistakes I see people make. So don't forget severance. The the standard or the benchmark that most people get is somewhere around like three months of base pay for non uh, for termination without cause. Um, so I usually will tell people to shoot a little above that, like six to 12 months, then you'll probably land among the stars around that like six to nine months kind of thing um but baseline that's something you should shoot for if you're you know lucky enough to have a little bit more leverage or you want to push harder on the severance package uh you can try to get you know prorated amounts of your bonus you can try to get continued vest vesting for your equity i mean again those are more of the 201 301 topics but at that yeah. 101 level, uh, just be thinking about how to protect yourself in a variety of situations that are outside of your control. Um, I'll pause. Do either yeah. in, in your careers, what does your two severance packages look like? Well, I'll be honest. I don't have one in this role uh, that, I'm in, that I know of, right? I didn't negotiate one on the way in. Um, I was laid off last year. Uh, I'm going to shy away from the company that I was laid off from uh, just for, you know, privacy reasons, mm -hmm. but they did provide a pretty good severance. I didn't know about that on the way in, mm -hmm. but this is a, this is a top five tech company. It's a fang company. So uh, it was a very generous se severance plan mm -hmm. and going through that process, uh, which was they bought the startup I worked for and then they carved us out and laid a bunch of us off. Um, and it was a very generous one. It was like a six month, severance package uh and with vestments and things like that in that period mm -hmm. and i continued to match my 401k or they continued mm -hmm. to match my 401k during that period my health benefits from that actually just recently expired so they they had this very long runway of staying on their health plan which was a very good one so after that experience shame on me that i didn't you know come into this next company that i worked for with a better negotiation on on what what happens on the back end but talking to you, and we had Dan Goodman on the podcast recently, I'm realizing that's you know the next role I go out for whenever that happens. I'm really going to put that into the negotiation up front because it, it was very helpful to have the six months mm -hmm. after you know getting laid off to just regroup and spend you know a casual amount of time going and looking for the right role. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I hope that that answers the question. I'll let Chase also chime in too on what he's got. I don't know what you negotiated, Chase. <laughs> Well, Devin, uh, I call myself a recovering entrepreneur turned SaaS sales executive. Uh, so I really, I come from being an entrepreneur of where I didn't have a safety net. Um, yeah. And when COVID happened, basically we had a brick and mortar juice bar and smoothie bar and we were doing X amount of revenue and then it completely got cut off or we couldn't go into the store anymore. And mm -hmm. so we had to pivot. Um and we became part of Shopify for startups and uh, we weren't doing the revenue that we were doing. And so I reached out to my Shopify rep and was like, hey, what do you suggest me to do? And she's like, SaaS sales, get into that. And so that's actually how I met Jesse. That was like two and a half years ago. And I was like, Jesse, I just cold outbounded him from listening to the podcast and just said, hey, man, I need to get a job in SaaS. How, how are we going to do this? He's like, give me 150 bucks. I'll do a coaching call with you. And he helped me get a role. But I, just like we're talking to you, I don't, I didn't know about this, that I could negotiate these things. Yeah. Uh, well, and a lot of people are terrified to bring up severance specifically because yeah. it, it looks, they think it looks bad, right? They think well, it like, sounds like you might have a negative outlook. Oh, on, it's like, hey, I don't trust this company's going to make but, it, right? But right. you, you got to do it before the bad shit happens. It's like mm -hmm. you're, you don't want to, like Dan was talking about, you don't want to do it when they're cutting you off. Or you're on the pip, and then you talk about severance. Yeah, I mean, like, have it way too late. Yeah, I mean, it's, have it before. It's, yeah, it's it's like a prenup to some people. They just think it's awkward, <laughs> right? They're, they're like, oh, yeah. this puts that seed in their mind that they think it might not work out, kind of thing. Right. But 
again, back to the the what, the education piece of like, mm-hmm. okay, this is this is termination without cause. This is not, you know, for performance reasons. This is something else went sideways and it's for your own protection kind of thing. So again, a lot of this is um how you frame it and the 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 talk track you use. And that's what I try and help people out a lot with is not just like, okay, go get these th- these things but this is a tactical way of asking for it or of phrasing it so that is a lot of what i've put in the book and would you say you're mainly dealing with hr that who's giving you the the offer or is it going to be the person who is you're actually interviewing who are you dealing with on these negotiations usually well usually at the executive level it's it's the executives themselves, like whoever my boss is going to be. Um, I mean, I've worked at startups and public companies and even at the public company, I was going to report into the CEO. So I was dealing with the CEO kind of thing. Uh, And that's generally, unless you've got layers of recruiters and it's more complicated and yada, yada, yada. I just talked to somebody who was um, negotiating for a role. I'll keep this anonymous, but it was for a company that a, a private equity firm owned. And uh, uh, a very large company, a very intense company. And like they put him through so many ringers and talking to so many folks when it came to like putting him through IQ tests and behavioral tests. Wow. And like, you know, it, it was it was this whole gamut of not just the hiring manager, not the, just the executive. So it depends on, you know, size, scale, stage of company, type of role, all those things who you're going to be talking to along the way. Mm-hmm. But uh Hey, maybe you'll have to write or do an IQ test at some point. You should brush up for that. Yeah. (laughs) So um, maybe give us some some other ways that you've helped Mm -hmm. clients or other things you outline in the book that might help someone going into specifically around the severance piece. Mm -hmm. Because again, I think there is a lot of like negative mindset that goes into that because to your point, it's like a, a prenup, you know, nobody wants to talk about what the bad outcomes could be yeah Um, i mean so how can yeah how can people beat that mindset i mean with severance it's uh it's often positioning it as the the without cause piece um and like i said the components that i would tend to focus on are the length trying to get it as long as possible the more senior you are the closer you can get to a year hopefully uh, and then trying to get a piece of prorated bonus, continued vesting, the things you mentioned, Jesse, that you had with yours yeah. are often good, uh, good extras. Um, beyond severance, I mean, like if we kept working through the different elements, um, bonuses, I mean, bonuses are all over the place. There's so many different ways to structure them, but I think they're generally two or three mistakes I see uh, pretty consistently, which is number one, they're often way too low. Uh, I've seen even at the executive level, like five, six, 7% bonuses. And I'm like, how can those even be motivating? Um, Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me if this sounds like you. You're a sales hunter with literally hundreds of target accounts in your territory and no idea who in your patch is even in the market for your solution. You've pulled all the reports, built all the lists, and you've done a bunch of account research, but you're still in the dark about where to find your low-hanging fruit. And look, you could waste another quarter smiling and dialing, grinding through a cold list, and blasting out emails, or you could do what I do and get Leadfeeder. Leadfeeder identifies the companies that visit your company's website and tracks on-site activity so you can see which leads from your region are ready to buy right now. Leadfeeder has customizable notifications, lead scoring, routing, and it works seamlessly with your CRM system. Right now, Sales Players has got the hookup on an extended 21-day free trial offer, so be sure to use the link in the show notes to sign up. Oh, and you should probably forward that link over to your ops team so they can get lead feeders set up for your whole team. Stop burning time and resources on leads that don't convert and sign up for lead feeder. They're performance-based. They should be win-win, so... I'm a huge fan of making them at least 20 to 30% of your OTE. And if a lot of sellers are listening to this, that, you know, you're used to a higher commission percent, more performance-based yeah. comp. So maybe that's not as as much of a thing. But I'll tell you, in other roles, holy crap, it's like minuscule, pit, pit, pitiful little bonuses that, that, that aren't yeah. anything. Um, 
The second mistake would be the accelerator piece. Like a lot of folks don't have accelerators. Uh, so they lose out on overachieving if they're hitting their target. Um, and I think even beyond sales, if there's anyone that's not a seller listening to this, like that's something that any type of function or role can have as well. It's not just yeah. limited to salespeople. So if you're, you're a seller who switches into a different function, like I know a lot of SDRs who go down the, you know, the, the CX route or the marketing route or whatever, like all of those, you don't have to give up your accelerators or your kickers. Like those oh, can continue yeah. into different types of functions and roles as well. Right. Um, and then, for like marketing, like what would be some KPIs that you would see? So I was always a fan of trying to craft my bonus around areas that I could control, uh, which would be pipeline, a lot of like opportunity metrics that, you know, still map to sales and that mattered, uh, but weren't fluffy like leads and website traffic and like all that kind of stuff. So that was usually the 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 sweet spot in the middle was some kind of like opportunity value or pipeline okay. value. Um, and that would be a percent of it. And then another percent would be financial target, things like that. Um, but yeah, I know I know a lot of companies do MBOs. I think it's management I mean, by objective is what that stands for. And that dates back to like mm -hmm. Andy Grove or Peter Drucker, one of those like business thinkers who wrote mm -hmm. a book on it. But I know what, so I oh, many years ago switched from being a seller to a SDR manager. Mm -hmm. And yes, there was some commissions based on, you know, pipeline production, but I was also comped on MBOs, which was things like working together with the marketing team to build a, a joint strategy around, you know, bringing things through the funnel mm -hmm. or working with our operations team to make the CRM more efficient. Some of those different things that were like, they're ultimately tied to revenue, but they're there's not necessarily a super clear, like there is a clear, you know, hey, you either did these things or you didn't, and that's how you earn the MBOs. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't always translate directly to like cash coming in, right? Mm -hmm. So for anyone out there who's like going to switch out of, of sales into something else, you know, definitely consider doing some research on potential MBOs as like a, you know, and there was some percentage of what my total comp was every quarter, as long as we hit like these more qualitative targets, like, mm -hmm you know, did you collaborate with the team to do this? And did you execute on this? Like OKRs is another one you hear about a lot. I know we use that where I work. It's, you know, a lot of companies from the top down will have these objectives and then key results. And again, a lot of them, some of them are quantitative, but a lot of them are qualitative things. Like, you know, did you bring the team together five times for a, you know, review of this or whatever? So definitely probe around and ask about those. Like I always tell people that I work with, uh, on my, you know, on the coaching side that I do, because I, I, I coach folks on helping land tech roles. And so as Chase mentioned, and so I always talk about how like, there's just, there's all kinds of ways that these companies can compensate you. But to your point earlier, uh, Devin is like, people just don't know how to ask, mm -hmm. you know, or they just don't know to ask for things like MBOs mm -hmm. or severance upfront or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a sign on bonus is one that I coach to a lot because yeah. I didn't even learn that that was a thing until I kind of stumbled into one by asking for an insanely high number and having them come back and say, why don't we pay the difference in a sign-on bonus? Yep. And I was like, salespeople can get sign-on bonus. I thought that was something that only like the most elite engineers in the Bay area would get mm. um, because they're just top tip, you know, tip top, but like yeah. anyone can get a sign-on bonus regardless of what role you're going out for. You just have to learn how to ask for it in a way that's, that's tactful mm -hmm. and in the right way. And I, I, yeah, I'm curious if you have helped your clients negotiate something along those lines. And if you have any thoughts on that. Yes, hundred percent. So that you're, you're a good segue into what I would call kind of mistake number three, which is yeah. uh, not getting extra creative with different types of bonuses. Mm -hmm. So Sign-on bonus is a great one uh, that we can break down a little bit more. Milestone bonuses often are completely forgotten about, yet to me, almost more preferable than equity in some situations. Like, um, uh, it's just a creative way to earn a lot more without having necessarily that ownership position in the company. So, you know, an example would be... Um, if you're coming in as, uh, I had a, a friend who was a CFO at a startup and he knew that the company wanted to go public, 
So he put a milestone bonus on that. He said, hey, I've helped other companies do this before. If we IPO, cut me a check for 100 grand. And that's the type wow. of like, you know, six, seven figure bounty that I'd be thinking about putting on really important goals of the company, like board level visible type goals. And then you're more in control of hitting that than some exit down the road, some kind of liquidity event that depends on all these macroeconomic forces and how the VCs feel that day and yada, yada, yada. Like as long as you are more in control of whatever MBO that you mentioned earlier or, uh, you know, big company target, then that often helps people focus on those things in their role. Wow. A milestone, but I had not heard of that one. Yeah. Uh, and that's, yeah. yeah. That, yeah, uh, that, like they're my favorite thing now. Yeah. Like that's actually that was... where I generally start with yeah. a lot of clients is, okay, what are the big goals of the company? How do that? How does that map to your role? And what could we propose to squeeze a lot more juice out of this fruit? And um, another example was uh, I helped a chief growth officer uh, negotiate for a role at a a startup that wasn't necessarily flush with cash, but I mean, this is somebody who's going to be responsible for the growth of that company. So how can they associate milestones to that growth? And this company was uh, almost 20 million ARR, of course, having visions of a hundred and beyond sort of thing. So we said, look, um, they didn't want to give up equity at that point because it was a bootstrap company. The founders had already had exits and weren't planning on selling for as far as the eye can see. So equity didn't even make sense in that situation. And so we said, okay, well, if there's not going to be equity, what's a different option? And the answer was, okay, milestones. Like if this person helped the company get from 20 to 30 to 40, 50, 60, 70, at each of those 10 million ARR marks, we said, okay, cut them a check for a percent of that. And they didn't actually sign that whole agreement, but they came to a really nice middle ground there where it added something like uh, five, between five and six million dollars into their comp plan. Yeah. So I, milestone bonuses, huge fan. Um, like sign on bonuses, like you said, definitely um, more common than I thought uh, early yeah. in my career as well. Um, you know, usually they're used for a few different reasons. Um, I think in your situation, it was probably to like not rock the boat. Like, you know, sometimes if what you're asking for is outside the normal range for that level, then they're going to give a, a bonus to close the gap and, and keep certain salaries and bands equitable, right? Um, another way you can propose a sign-on is generally to frame it as like something to make up for benefits you're leaving behind. Like if you're going to lose out on a bonus at your last company or a uh, vesting period or something like that, or you want to exercise your options at the last company, like you're going to need cash to do that. Okay. Tell them, give me this. And it's, 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 it's a, you know, done deal. Um, and then third, you know, you're going to get bigger sign on bonuses if there's more competition. Like if there are a lot of multiple offers on the table, then yeah. you can really play those off of each other. And it's a uh, it's good closer. Another way just to add on to one specifically for sellers mm-hmm. and for, for the folks listening is historically for sales, you would typically, especially in tech sales, you would get a non-recoverable draw. And what I've found over the last n- number of years is generally that's gone away, or at least I think it's reserved for the people who ask for it. I think if you go through the interview process and you're not thinking to ask for a draw, you won't get it. And just to explain, because I think there's a lot of folks out there that don't even know what a draw is in sales because of the performance, you know, the fact that it's a performance based role, your first three, six, nine months in the role, you're sometimes not going to close anything because you have to go in and learn the product. You have to learn the market and the industry and you have to build your book of business mm-hmm. and your account plan and all those things. And so you're just making half of your salary. If you're an, if you're an AE in tech, you know, usually your salary and your upside is 50, 50 split. And so, uh, one of the ways that I've been able to, you know, and I've heard, I've, I've done both, you know, sign on bonus and a draw, which is like for the first three months in the sales role, I have to learn the product and I have to invest time and energy into building pipeline. I need to be compensated for those first three months in the role. 
Therefore, uh, you know, I would expect a non-recoverable draw, non-recoverable meaning that they, they don't take it back after, you know, some amount of time if you leave the company, but mm -hmm. that it's money paid out almost as commissions, almost as if you were hitting your full targets for those first few months. So I talk to a lot of sellers and they don't even know about this, but early in my career, when I would talk to sellers who'd been doing this since the early 2000s or the late nineties or had sold, you know, on-premise tech and different things. It was just standard that it was like not even a question of whether you get a draw or not, but it seems like the trend as of the last, you know, several years at least is employers are holding on to that. They're not going to bring that up in the interview process. If you bring it up, you can have the conversation, but mm -hmm. it's just a reminder out there to anyone out there listening to just be sure to ask for those kinds of things. So in addition to everything else Devin's talking about, there's also draws on the table for sellers that are, you know, based on on ramp up and and getting some compensation for your time building pipeline and building your book of business. 100%. There's and they're all flavors of clawback protection and when you get into the equity side, I mean all the the triggers and double triggers and yada yada yada. It's uh it's eye opening. I mean, like I said, I got screwed myself so Talk many times. Talk to us times about that getting screwed. Like what yeah. happened? Just tell me, like, can you paint a story, like, what happened? Uh, I mean, okay, so this was, <laughs> as much as you, you know, can. fresh baby face Devin right outside of school, right? Like, post starting my own company and that blowing up and that story I told. I mean, yeah. you know, I was the first marketing person at this company. So I didn't have a track record. I wasn't, like, a proven executive. So it's not like I deserved everything under the sun right um but certainly that early at a startup is generally going to get some amount of equity i had zero equity at the very beginning yeah. right just wasn't smart enough to know the difference between stock options and rsus let alone benchmarks of how much to negotiate at what different levels and titles and seniority and everything right so luckily i mean the company did the right thing and helped make up down the road for certain you know, um, situations and people. But I mean, I still have a lot of share certificates in my basement collecting dust. I have things that probably weren't as much as they should be. All, all of that. Um, yeah. And uh, I was going to ask you guys too, what like, what you remember about negotiating your first compensation? Because like, I remember especially at the leadership level. Um, I remember this so clearly and it's so embarrassing, but I'll tell this story anyway. So like I had been head of marketing at that tiny little startup and I left to go move somewhere and do something else. But then my old boss hit me up a year later. This is 2014 or something. And he said, I'm in town. I want to grab drinks. So I said, sure. And we met up at this pub and he asks after a few drinks, like, what's it going to take to get you to come back? And so all of a sudden, okay, it's sprung and he's asking for a number first. And I don't know that I shouldn't do that yet and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so he says, what's it going to take to get you to come back? And I said, honestly, and I thought this was really slick. I said, honestly, the number's going to have to start with an eight, like $80,000. And, and he was like, I think we can do that. But like, how <laughs> bad is that? How bad is that? It's like, thank yeah. God I've learned a ton in 10 oh. years. It's yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I just, Bro. you know, for some of my early roles, I just took whatever was on the table. Like I mm -hmm. didn't think it's not that I didn't want to negotiate. I knew I was probably supposed to, mm -hmm. but the fear of like losing out on the opportunity, just back to what we talked about earlier was too great. So I just was like, yeah, sure. Send me the letter. I'll sign it. Yeah. I'm very fortunate because I, I ended up in a, you know, within a few years early in my career, worked for uh, a CEO founder who was a stellar negotiator and mm -hmm. he's a mentor of mine. And so he, you know, he and I talked a lot about exec compensation actually, because I was very curious on the topic. I'm like, how do, especially because I, I always read these headlines about like, even for example, recently, like the Boeing CEO just sort of parachuted away from this like dumpster fire of a company <laughs> uh, as Boeing and, you know, made tens of millions, maybe more hundreds of millions. I don't know what, what the comp plan was, mm -hmm. but parachuting away and he's probably not gonna have to ever work again yeah. um and i'm like how did that person come into boeing and you know negotiate all this stuff just you know in some ways destroy the company i, I don't know I, mean, <laughs> I don't have all the details on Boeing. those honestly. are super fun stories like i get a kick out of the the crazy stuff right these are some of my right. 
most viral videos on on TikTok because of course they are. Yeah. But it's like, oh, the stories of execs negotiating God, like long term storage of their wine collections and six figure jobs for their spouses and forty five thousand dollars to fly their cat private and like you know all these like wild things that are just entertaining most of us mortals are never going to get like a free mansion we never have to repay and you know yeah. that level of thing but i mean it's it's entertaining <laughs> how, how do they have the leverage to do that? like i think about one of them that, that comes to mind is wells fargo because i was a wells fargo customer for a long time and they got caught up in this whole thing where they were opening fake accounts and so i left i was like i'm not going to be an account holder here i took my money mm -hmm. elsewhere and then I remember reading that the CEO just parachuted away with hundreds of millions of dollars. I think he got to keep the plane that they had given him. Mm. Um, and I'm like, this guy was the problem, you know? Like, and I know those are all edge cases. Like not every CEO is out there trying to be greedy like this guy. But I'm always surprised. Um, one, like before you existed, Devin, and had your compensation Bible, how did these people learn how to negotiate things? <laughs> like I want my spouse to like, cause it's cool that you're talking about it. Cause you know, the regular Joes like us can actually read your book and, and hear about, you know, watch your TikToks and learn about this stuff. But yeah. I think, I imagine it must've been decades and decades leading up to now where some small population knew that these things were negotiable mm -hmm. and they, they knew they had the leverage to go in mm. and ask for a plane and a house mm. and a job for their spouse and a wine collection. And, whatever other things they're negotiating. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you think people learned this before you existed? <laughs> well, Illuminati. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Illuminati. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> look, a good case study is look at like a lot of um, Hollywood actor riders and packages and things that agents negotiate for the A-list, right? Like they command these crazy things because they can, because, you know, they're perceived as the person for the job that can come in and fix whatever mess or star in whatever thing and sell a trillion tickets or, or whatnot. So, I mean, it is ultimately about leverage. And if the people hiring you think you're going to solve all their problems, you'd be surprised what they'd give you. Um, some of those stories from like back in the day are also like regulated against now. Like there are some crazy things that people used to get that no way today they'd be able to get. Um, but, uh, it's, it's how frothy is the market? How much do they want you? How do you know? Do you, are you friends with such and such yada, yada, yada? So those wild things, I mean, are fun to talk about. I, I usually like scale it back to like, what is the average Joe think is wild, but they could get actually, right. Right. um, and that's sort of a, a fun bucket because a lot of people don't think so much about all those additionals it's, again because their imagination is just limited by their previous roles so um be it you know beyond the sign-on bonus like how to get like executive coaching and executive assistance and personal perks like gym memberships and daycare and car service and um like upgraded travel a really uh you know popular one that i help a lot of people get is premium flight so you know for flights up to call it four or five hours negotiate premium economy for anything longer than that negotiate business class if it's five plus or intercontinental stuff like that it's just a more mature way of framing those things than you know go walking in and saying god like to fly private or you know first class or whatever so um yeah. all that stuff can be fun i recommend people just like you know pour yourself a drink write out a list of like what your ideal package looks like and then you know um, see what you know see what you can throw in if they say no i mean worst case is you take that off the table for something else kind of and devin so at what period of time do we need to engage a person like you in the service and as i'm going you know navigating not looking for a new role but increasing my role uh in a job when should somebody engage you and uh where can people yeah. find out about you yeah i mean i uh I had written this book, this senior compensation Bible, like two years ago and sold a decent amount and then put it aside. And it wasn't until I had a new offer come across my plate that I'm like, oh, I need to go dust that thing off and reread it. And I reread it and I'm like, holy shit, this thing is good. <laughs> and it helped me. <laughs> my, my previous self was helping my future self negotiate through an offer and the milestone payments wow. and everything. So, uh, have it in your back pocket. Have it right now because okay. 
you are going to need it uh, like I did at some point. The average tenure journey. of an yep. executive is like a year and a half. So people are switching jobs like crazy. You're not going to need this down the road. You're going to need it sooner than you think. So that's my quick plug for the comp Bible. That's compensationbible.com. Um, I also do offer consulting. So two different things that might be interesting. Number one is just a, an open consulting kind of hour where we can go through your comp package just one-on-one, -on -one, compare it to benchmarks. I can make recommendations and help you map out like your next steps to growing into your next role or what compensation you want to see. So that's what I call compensation consulting. Um, and then the other one is more if you're negotiating like an active offer. Like if you want help right now negotiating something because you've got an offer in your in your hands or you're about to get one, uh, I've seen some really bad ones lately. So please reach out and uh, I'm here to help get you as much as possible. Awesome. So we're going to add this information into our free Slack channel. So if you're not a part of the actual sales players Slack channel, we have a free Slack channel. You have access to Jesse and I. We'll put all these resources in there. Also, we'll be publishing our email list that comes out weekly, comes out on Sundays. And uh, thanks again for coming on the show, Devin. It's been really fun. Thanks a lot. Devin, this was awesome. Wait, man. we thanks didn't for get to say what your comp packages are. Please reveal. <laughs> Let's rip Till next apart. time, oh, to be continued. Right. <laughs>